everybody, it is I, your all-time favorite rogue scientist, Richard Blyle. Let's have a little bit of fun today with a little project I like to call Amuse Your Friends and Annoy Your Enemies. Let's make our own atomic warhead. Yes, how to build an atomic bomb. Now, I'm sure there are already a couple of questions that some of you may have out there. First and foremost, by the end of this video, are you actually going to know how to build an atomic bomb? Yes, you are. We're talking an atomic bomb, not a nuclear bomb. Uh, and it turns out it is surprisingly easy to do. Second question is, is national security going to be going to be looking at me because I'm watching this video? The answer is yes, they are not interested. They have the capabilities, but they are not going to be interested. Reason is very simple. There's a couple of reasons why the NSA doesn't really care if you know how to make an atomic bomb. First of all, this is public knowledge. Uh, you may not have seen it before, and there's a chance you may have. If you actually went out and looked it up, uh, you may discover that you've, you already know a lot of this stuff. A lot of it is actually alluded to in the movie Oppenheimer. Um, but the second reason they're not going to care is because there is a bottleneck. You will never be able to set it off. And I will explain why towards the end of the video. But before we get into how to build an atomic bomb, we need to say hi to my kitten, Star, who is outside meowing. Hi, sweetheart. Let's talk a little bit about nuclear physics and uh, some of that. Now, I'm actually a chemist. I'm not a physicist, but my degree has always been kind of borderline between chemistry and physics. Uh, so, I'm, for a chemist, I'm very well versed in physics. Um, and I happen to have had a friend, yes, I had a friend, who uh, was sort of the, for a time, the national expert the top expert in uh, nuclear science as a civilian, not the top military or engineering expert, but the top civilian expert. And I, uh, basically all of this I learned from him. Not all, most of it. Let's talk a little bit about nuclear science. Nuclear chemistry is a little bit different than regular chemistry. Back in the 19th century, John Dalton introduced his atomic theory, which was very much based on uh, the theory that was put forth by the atomists around 500 BC. Um, and everyone believed it was true, and it really is. In fact, we're still studying at, uh, Dalton's atomic theory today. That's what chemistry really is based on. But there were four key pieces to the atomic theory that he proposed. Some of them are absolutely true. Some of them, we find there are times that they're not. One of the things that he proposed was that atoms were indestructible. Uh, and everyone believed it's true. And for the sake of chemistry, it's a good assumption. Because we're not looking at uh, atoms that change, but imagine around the time, late, eight, uh, late 19th century, around the time of Madame Curie and her husband Pierre, um, imagine when they started discovering elements like radium. That not only were not, were, were destructive, not only could you destroy them, they were falling apart on their own. This was a stroke of luck because it was through those what we call radioisotopes. These are isotopes that undergo nuclear processes. These radioisotopes uh, gave off subatomic particles and it's how we discovered what we now know about protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yes, if you are a high energy physicist, you can go on and say, well, what about quarks and leptons and yada yada and muons? That's beyond the scope of chemistry and certainly beyond the scope of today's lecture. So, there are actually two types of nuclear reactions. We have fission, 
and we have fusion. England is actually very far ahead of us in nuclear technology because they invented the fission chips. Fission is the process that we're actually going to be using today. It is the process of going from a large atom to smaller ones. The nucleus is actually breaking apart. So you might start off with something like uranium. End up, end up with smaller elements um, as it falls apart. This is the big difference between nuclear chemistry and regular chemistry. In, nuclear che in, in regular chemistry, the elements never, never, never change. We are not interested in how elements change from one to another. The alchemists would have called this transmutation. We're interested in how the elements behave on their own. So that's why this is actually beyond the scope of a regular chemistry course. They might touch on it. Um, but uh, this is not what chemistry is. This is nuclear physics or nuclear chemistry. Um, in the process of falling apart, these elements always give off a great amount of energy. We're talking two or three orders of magnitude greater than any chemical explosion. Um, but they also give off, and this is going to be important, three neutrons. Don't ask me why it's always three, but it's what we found. A fission reaction. Every element, every nucleus that falls apart forms two smaller elements and gives off three neutrons and that will be important in just a moment here. Fusion is the exact opposite. In fusion, you smash together small elements, like hydrogen, to form larger ones. This process of fusion gives off even more energy than fission. Maybe a hundred, a thousand times more energy. So this actually gives off more energy than fission. This might sound weird to you, especially if you have a fundamental understanding of thermodynamics. How is it possible that both the fission process and the fusion process release energy? The secret is in the size of the elements that you're using. Particularly large elements will release energy under fission, but not fusion. Particularly small elements will release energy under fusion, but not fission. That's why the hydrogen bomb has nothing to do with burning the hydrogen in the bomb. The hydrogen bomb is forming helium out of hydrogen by fusing those nuclei together. That's the reaction that's occurring in the sun. That's a lot of energy. Um, we're only going to talk about how to make a fission bomb because you can do that from stuff in your basement. I have seven of these, of these fission bombs in my basement right now, even as we speak. Um, so if we can make a fission bomb. Fusion bombs are a lot more complicated. By the way, in case you're curious, the cutoff point is iron. As it turns out, iron is the most stable nucleus on the periodic chart. So anything smaller than iron would give off energy under fusion. Anything larger than ion would give off energy under fission. So suppose we have some sort of a fissionable core. Uranium-235. For example, every time one of these nuclei fall apart, it gives off three neutrons. Always three neutrons. 
three things can happen to these neutrons. Is that just a coincidence? God could answer that question. I can't. But if you think about it, it's logical. First of all, the neutron can simply leave the mass. No harm, no foul. The neutron is gone. Nothing else happens to it. It's going to go off into space somewhere, or it's going to go somewhere into the, into the room, into the atmosphere, eventually collide with something. But it's not going to do anything. Another thing that can happen is it can collide with an impurity. Here's something strange. The nuclear cores inside every atomic weapon, which by the way includes nuclear weapons because the uh, uh, energy required to start the fusion reaction comes from a fission reaction. So every nuclear or atomic warhead ever built has a lifespan because those elements in the uranium or plutonium, depending on what the, the, the core is, they're de decomposing and forming other things. They're forming lead, uh, they're forming radon, they're forming pff, who knows what. Actually, you can figure it out if you understand nuclear physics. I didn't look it up, so I don't have that right off the top of my head, but every one time that one of these falls apart, it creates two part, two atoms that are actually impurities, that are small enough that when this neutron hits that impurity, it just gets absorbed. That's all there is to it. No harm, no foul. Nothing comes of it. The third possibility is that the neutron will strike another fissionable atom, another uranium, and that's going to force that uranium to undergo a fission reaction, forming two new elements, and giving off three more neutrons. This is propagation. Because every one of these neutrons can then hit another uranium, which would give off three more neutrons. One of those could hit a uranium that would give off three more neutrons, and all of a sudden you go from one to three to nine, and it's an exponential growth. This is why atomic bombs are so devastating, because each one of them gives off a little bit of energy, it gives off a lot of energy compared to a chemical reaction. And every time it gives off energy, it just grows every cycle. It's giving off more because there are more and more atoms adding to that. In fact, well over 98% of the total energy released will be released in the very last three cycles. That's an explosion. All that energy released, boom, all at once. This is, by the way, also how atomic, uh, I'm sorry, atomic power plants are controlled. They keep track of the overall temperature and they use control rods, which are basically just rods of lead. If this starts going too fast, if it starts heating up, they will insert the control rods deeper, which all act as impurities and absorb some of these neutrons. If the reaction is going too slowly, they pull those rods out and the reaction speeds up until it's, again, sustainable. But in a bomb, we don't want to control it. We want it out of control. We want it to explode. So what causes the actual explosion? It's all probability. When the probability of a neutron striking another fissionable atom, when that probability is greater than the probability of leaving and impurity. 
but this probability is greater than, let's say, the harmless probabilities being absorbed or leaving the mass. When this probability is greater, you're going to have an uncontrolled reaction, you're going to have an atomic bomb. This gives rise to something called critical mass. Now, they don't actually use critical mass anymore, but we will in our bomb. Critical mass. Critical mass simply says that we have so much of this uranium fuel If it's subcritical mass, no explosion. But once we reach critical mass and this probability becomes dominant, that's when the bomb will go off. Basically, by increasing math, we are increasing the pathway by which these neutrons have to travel before leaving the mass, which means we are reducing this probability here. We are reducing the probability that that neutron will leave harmless. And that's how you build an atomic bomb. This actually is not how they do it today. We'll talk about that in a minute here. But here's how you build an atomic bomb. You ready? In fact, this is analogous. Now, of course, this is kind of crude. Engineers and scientists build much better devices than this, but this is analogous to the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And by the way, we owe a debt of gratitude to Japan. They were, they were not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were forced to volunteer for this. I mean, this was wartime. It's not like they said, oh, let's do this. But the bombs that were dropped on Japan showed the horrific nature of these weapons. We never have seen it before. So politicians, all we could talk about was theory. With Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we saw the devastation. That means that our politicians were less likely to use those weapons again after they had developed into more sophisticated fission bombs. Um, George W. Bush was the first president who was too young to remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And a lot of the nuclear physicists were really nervous when he went into the presidency. Um, Kennedy, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's been suggested that he never released atomic weapons because he knew what it would do. He saw it. He wasn't there in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but he certainly was aware of it, and that's why he hesitated. Um, the first bomb that was ever made consisted of two, count them, two uranium cores. The first one was kind of the shape of a donut. The second one was kind of the shape of a plug. They put a little explosive charge here. Of course, they had it lined up. Both of these two cores were sub-critical mass. And when they wanted the bomb to go off, all they did was throw this plug into this hole. Poof. All of a sudden, it became greater than critical mass, and we had our atomic explosion. That's how you build an atomic warhead. That's all there is to it. You can take two pieces of subcritical mass uranium with some sort of a bear trap trigger. It just smashes them together, and all of a sudden you go to critical mass, boom, it explodes. I'm not going to give you the details on how to build trigger mechanisms and whatnot, but you can see it's not that hard to figure out. Two pieces of core of uranium, 
smash them together, it becomes an atomic bomb. These days they don't use critical mass anymore. Today they use critical density. You have your mass with all of your atoms in it. And what they do is surround it with highly tuned explosives. Now you have to be careful. This is why this is not something that we, you and I, have the knowledge to do. These are both a mixture of fast and slow explosives, and they are designed not to blow up the uranium or the plutonium, as the case may be. These are designed to cause an implosion. It takes that mass of uranium or plutonium, smat, forces it into a smaller volume, with a smaller volume, these atoms are closer together. And when those atoms are closer together, the probability of one of these neutrons hitting another fissionable atom increases. So what they really do is they decrease the amount of distance between them so it's more likely that something will get hit that you don't want hit if you don't want a nuclear reaction. These are, if you hear about military explosives like C4, they've developed all of these high-powered explosives designed just specifically for that. Much harder to build in the basement. This, piece of cake, no problem. Now, I've started to talk to you about the lifespan of these things. Keep in mind, this uranium is falling apart, or plutonium, as the case may be. Um, as it falls apart, it creates its own impurity within the core. Once that impurity reaches a certain level, this has to be excessively pure to have an atomic bomb. Once this becomes, has enough impurity, it's not going to explode. So you're not going to get an atomic explosion. These explosions are enough to level a couple of buildings, but certainly not, uh, certainly not a downtown area. An atomic bomb could level an entire downtown area of a city. A nuclear bomb could actually level suburbs in a much wider area, and that's what all of these things do. It's like we're trying to get to bigger and bigger areas. Why? Because as a species, humans are insane. And herein, by the way, lies the reason that even if you build one of these, and if you believe Oppenheimer, it looks like the, the uranium core has to be about yay big. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. They've actually never told us what uh, critical mass is. I don't know. Maybe it's been published somewhere. Um, but you will never, this is the big problem, is getting pure enough uranium to have fissionable material. There's a little bit of comfort in the thought that these things have a lifespan. When the Soviet Union fell apart, they were pulling out of regions that were originally part of the Soviet Union, like Latvia, leaving behind the nuclear weapons because they just didn't have time to move them. For a time, Latvia was one of the main nuclear superpowers in the world. Now, of course, Russia never gave the new governments their access codes, so it's not like Latvia could use those weapons. But basically, these cores, it's been estimated that if these cores are 20 years old, there's a 50-50 chance that they will not explode. Soviet Union fell apart, what, 40 years ago? So, maybe if they happen to find the access codes, one in four, one in five might still explode, but the odds are very low. Those are now useless weapons, and that's why the U.S. has to replace that core. They do it every ten years. Um, the problem with getting this pure is not the uranium. If I have many, many friends who live in South Dakota, 
In South Dakota, if you get a soil sample, you have uranium. Turns out, uranium is a naturally occurring element that happens in the soil. And uranium, by the way, are radioisotopes. There's a, mis there's a misconception. There's a mistake that people make saying all of our energy comes from the sun. No, it's not true. Most of our energy comes from the sun. But it has been estimated that in order to remain alive, in order to survive, in order to maintain a temperature where life can exist, which doesn't feel like it today because it is bitterly cold, but even bitterly cold is excessively hot compared to the average temperature of the universe. But roughly 20% of the heat that allows us to survive comes from the decay, the natural decay of radioisotopes in the soil. 20%. If you're living in an area that has a high risk of radon, you're living in an area that's high in radioisotopes, uranium or plutonium, or some other isotope. Because radon, as it turns out, occurs as part of the natural decay process of radioisotopes. It's one of the elements along the path as it decays. The decay will eventually stop at lead, but before it hits lead, it hits radon, which is a gas. Radon itself is an inert gas. There's no risk with radon except for the fact that radon continues to decay. And as radon decays, if you breathe it in and you have radon in your body, that radon is going to release gamma rays, which is very damaging to cells, and eventually it's going to become lead, which is a heavy metal poison. That's the danger with radon. But if you have a sample of uranium, the university where I got my uh, tenure, down in the basement of the science building once, and sure enough, there's a soil there that said uranium soil. It was just soil. And this soil had uranium in it. Now, as a chemist, it is easy for me to to collect and purify uranium from soil. That's very easy to do. You react it with certain acids to create certain salts. You find, form a salt that is soluble in water under some conditions. Maybe it's soluble as an acid. You filter it out to get rid of all of the solids. You neutralize that acid and all of a sudden it becomes insoluble and there you go. Uranium crystals, and it's just a matter of reducing it back to the uranium element, back to the metal. Very easy to do, but that uranium, it's a mixture of isotopes. An isotope of an element has the exact same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Uranium fuel is specifically uranium-235. very specific isotope. Now it's still uranium, and this is where the problem is. It's still uranium, which means you can, it, it, it undergoes the exact same chemical reactions, it has the exact same chemical properties as your bulk run-of-the-mill uranium. The only difference between these two is the mass of the isotope. That's the only difference. You cannot further purify this with chemical techniques. I know the principles on how to purify this. And this is why the government doesn't care if you know how to build an atomic bomb. Or even if you build one that in principle would work if you had the uranium fuel. But in order to purify one specific isotope out of a sample of uranium, that takes a lot to do. In fact, that requires the resources of a national government. That's why you don't hear about Tom's garage down the, down the street purifying uranium. These kinds of resources, well, 
sadly, with corporate greed being what it is, there aren't people wealthy enough that, you know, maybe they have the resources to do it. But for the most part, you need an entire government to throw resources at this, to get space that you need, which is going to take a lot of space, um, to get the money that's required to hire uh, the, the physicists that you need to hire the engineers with very high precision instruments. Um, you'll never do it. My apologies, I don't mean to insult you, I'm not saying you're not talented. You might be an extremely skilled physicist or engineer or chemist, I don't know. You're not going to have all of the expertise that you need. You're not going to have the resources. So why did I show you this? Well, you learned a little something about nuclear chemistry, didn't you? Learned a little something about fissionable materials. Um, these days, they don't use, well, they do still make atomic bombs, but they use it as fuel for the fission bombs, for the, for the uh, uh, nu nuclear bombs. But the nuclear bombs mostly gives off a lot of heat. So, even with the fission bomb, they wrap another bomb around it. Modern warheads are called fission, fusion, fission bombs. Here's what happens. In order to build this, you start with a fission bomb. That's our uranium. Like I say, they don't use critical mass anymore, they use critical density. So they wrap this up with chemical bombs. The chemical bombs could easily take out a city block. Trivial. But they don't do that. They use it to create critical density and fissionable material, very highly purified fissionable material. That is used to plunge some form of plunger into a sample of hydrogen or lithium, some small element, like hydrogen. So here's your fission bomb following the fission bomb, by the way. The chemical explosives could take out city block, the fusion bomb, and I already went through this once, the fusion bomb could take out downtown. This is your fusion bomb. The fusion bomb has enough energy to take out downtown and some suburbs. That's not enough. So they wrap this in a giant steel, very tough shell. And then around the shell, they put low grade uranium or plutonium. Put enough energy in the even low grade uranium, and that's going to go off as well. So we basically built a larger fusion bomb. Uh, not fission, not fusion, fission. Fission, fusion, fission bomb. This fission bomb is going to give off a lot of power along with heat. So you get all the heat damage from the fusion bomb, plus you get uh, high pressure waves, uh, you get just a lot of force with it, and that will take out all of the surrounding neighborhoods and into the countryside. And that's really what we want, because we're men. And for men, the bigger, the better. Yes, you can take that as a double meaning, because it's how I mean it. Um, I am strong, I'm very convinced that these bombs are because of men who are insecure about their manhood. But this is a fission-fusion-fission bomb. This is the modern warhead that they use today. 
they still have to replace this uranium every five to uh, every ten years or so, give or take. And I hope you learned a little something. Not about how to build an atomic bomb. Because like I say, it'll never actually go off. You'll never be successful at building a bomb because you're not going to get the fuel. The fuel is the bottleneck. But the concept of building the bomb, oh, so simple. But in talking about this, you learn a little bit about nuclear chemistry and how it's different from atomic, uh, from regular chemistry. You learn a little bit about fission and fusion. Um, and I hope you found it interesting. Have a great evening!